All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 16th day of April in the year of our Lord, 2022. You know, there is something out there as deadly as believing you can be saved through your own good works. Saved through the commandments. Saved by your own righteousness before God. And that is believing in an empty faith a powerless salvation, a salvation that is not God's work either, but yours. It's simply a stripped-down system of works where you believe that because you said a thing or believed a doctrine or got baptized, you're going to heaven. The idea that, that that believing in Jesus doesn't have any content, it's just believing that he existed, that he died and rose from the dead, or maybe he died for all our sins. But that is not true Christianity. Christianity is a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, faith that involves commitment to Christ. You cannot separate the Greek word pistis, which is the word for faith, from the word faithfulness. It is the same word. It involves commitment. Faith and faithfulness are the same word in Greek. Jesus said to take up your cross and follow him. He talked about the cost, the potential cost. He warns us to count the cost before we decide to follow him. Now, that's one of the great plagues in modern evangelicalism, especially among those who are called Baptists, but not exclusively among them. The idea that because I believed a certain thing, or I went forward, or I said a prayer, or I confessed Jesus Christ as my Savior, or even my Savior and Lord, Because I did that, I'm saved. It's salvation as a bookkeeping entry in heaven. No, salvation is a relationship with God, not simply a change in status. And as an example of this, this person I ran into the other day who calls himself Faith on Fire, again, I think that is an allusion to the two sons of Aaron, not to any fire of the Holy Spirit. Uh, He had another video up. He's got a whole lot of bad videos called Calvinism Debunked in Two Minutes. Now, I've spent a lot of time studying Calvinism. And I was taken in by it for a while until I understood it thoroughly enough. You know, it looked like it had potential. Well, it doesn't. It's it's not that Calvinism's all wrong. It's just that at the very core, the the eternal decree of all things, that's the real poison in Calvinism. (sighs) That is the poison, and it doesn't come from the Bible. It comes from Aristotle and other pagan philosophers. Their idea of God. See, the, the, the idea of God of John Calvin is not the God of the Bible. It's the God of Aristotle and uh, Augustine, and Aquinas, not the God of the Bible. Anyway, uh, so there's definitely a problem with that, uh, with Calvinism in certain areas. However, easy believism is even more deadly. You can be a Calvinist and be saved. But if you do not have a relationship with God through true faith, through commitment to Christ... 
you cannot be saved because you have not believed in him. The idea of you can have is just an, an intellectual exercise is absurd, and that is what many dispensationalists, followers of John Darby and C.I. Schofield, have believed. I wouldn't put Darby quite so much in that category, but certainly the idea came along that the desire to minimize to works actually ends up minimizing the role of the Spirit of God in salvation. God, you come to God as you are, but God will not leave you as you are. Well, they don't seem to understand that. We've got people out there, they live like the devil, and they believe they're saved. All kinds of people like that, which is one of the reasons I'm attending a holiness church right now, even though I have some serious problems with their, some of their doctrines. I'm not a member of the church, but I fellowship there because it's an assembly of saints. And I've spoken about some of these issues with the pastor. And he understands where I'm coming from, and he doesn't think I'm necessarily wrong. <sighs> I don't want to get him in hot water either. But I didn't join a denomination. I didn't join an organization. I go there to attend the gathering of the saints, people that has, whose lives have been transformed. Now, one thing about them, the, the holiness movement and others, is the underpinning, the biblical underpinning of that is God's working in us, not simply a change in status as far as moving you from the lost column to the saved column in a ledger in heaven, but God changes you. The promises of the new covenant that Jesus died on that cross almost 2,000 years ago, to purchase for us was that are laid out in Ezekiel chapter 36 and Jeremiah chapter 31. And those are that he'll forgive us, but he also will take out our, heart, our stony dead heart, and he'll give us a new heart, a heart of flesh, on which he writes his commandments. He will give us a new spirit, and he will put his own spirit in us, and that we will be his children. He will be our God, and we will be his people, and we shall all know him. And Jesus says in chapter 17 of John, his, his high prayer to his father, that to know God is to, and Jesus Christ is to have eternal life. See, there's a whole lot more. It's about salvation is about what God does. The promises of the new covenant, which sets it apart from the covenant of Moses, is it's all about what God does in people. He saves us. And it's not an empty salvation. It's not merely a heavenly transaction. But it's an effectual salvation. And Calvinists generally hold to that. And I will agree with them on that. Easy believism people don't. And they dominate much of the Southern Baptists and the fundamental independent Baptists and some others. And it's deadly. Calvinism is much... Calvinism will not send you to hell. Empty salvation, a false gospel, will send you to hell. And I've rejected the core of Calvinism, the eternal decree of all things. That's the real poison in it. But these other, most people don't understand. Most Calvinists, they think of the five points, and it doesn't matter. Those are just people thinking about how does God save people. They're speculating a lot. And they're not always applying Scripture consistently in context, including looking at the proper time context. But uh, empty salvation, an empty gospel cannot save you. And that's where I have a huge problem with it. So we're going to listen 
to a few minutes of this Faith on Fire uh, titled um, Calvinism Debunked in Two Minutes, Whosoever or the Elect. That's not the issue at all. The issue is, do you have a relationship with God through Christ? Are you committed to follow Christ? Are you a disciple of Christ? Or are you just an amused bystander that's there for the loaves and the fishes? Until Jesus starts talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Why did he do that? He wanted to drive them away because he knew they were not following him because of his teaching or his miracles or of the fact that he had the words of life. They were following him because he filled their stomachs and they were back for more. So let's listen to this uh, young, very bad teacher. He fancies himself a teacher of Scripture, but he does not understand it. So here is... And we'll listen. This is Adrian Rogers. Uh, <coughs> refutes Calvinism. It's not about Calvinism. With the simplicity of biblical salvation. Now, biblical salvation is not an empty salvation. It's an effectual salvation because it's a work of God. You must be born again. And that doesn't involve just saying something. It's God's work in you. He must transform your heart. He must make you a new creature in Christ, which is the way Paul puts that. Jesus talks about this in John chapter 3. To a Pharisee who certainly believed in God, believed in the coming of the Messiah, named Nicodemus. He said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Huh. Referring to the promises of the new covenant in the prophets Ezekiel and Jeremiah in particular. So let's go and listen to this. Welcome everyone, I'm Brian, this is Faith on Fire, and I want to share this quick snippet here, of just about a two-minute part of a sermon, just beautiful, about the simplicity of salvation and the Christian message. It really is not complicated, it is simple, and whosoever shall believeth on the name of Jesus Christ shall be saved. In whosoever shall believeth on the name of Jesus Christ shall be saved is nowhere to be found in the Bible. Bits and pieces of it are. <laughs> But to believe on the name of Jesus Christ is to believe in Jesus Christ. To trust in him and to trust him. Again, it's a relationship. Christianity is a relationship, not with a church, not with a system of dogma or theology. It's a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. A real living relationship. A personal relationship. Y'all know what that is, right? Hmm. Enjoy this video from Dr. Adrian Rogers. You know, the gospel is so simple. Let me point out something. I, Adrian Rogers was a popular preacher. The way you, you become a popular, popular preacher and build a megachurch is to say what people want to hear. That's one of the ways, at least. That's the easy way to do it. You preach a false gospel, a cheap gospel, a cheap grace. See, let me give you an example. Yes, the, it, you, you come to Jesus as you are. He doesn't require you to come with gifts. He doesn't require you to come with righteousness. You don't have any. You're worthless. Jesus came to save worthless sinners like me. But he saves you from being a worthless sinner and makes you a child of God, a saint. Now, I don't believe in sinless perfectionism until Christ returns. But God changes you. He changes you. He changes your heart. And if that's not going on in you, maybe you better examine yourselves and see if you are really 
in Christ. Does the Spirit of Christ dwell in you? That's where Paul puts the test. John talks about another test. Do you love the brethren? That little book of 1 John, that's really about how you can know you've actually been saved, as opposed to not being saved, just thinking you are. Anyway, <clears throat> salvation is free, just like joining the military is free. It costs you nothing. You can be dirt poor and join the military. In fact, a lot more people that are dirt poor than rich join the military. It's a bit like the kingdom of heaven in that way. The rich tend to avoid it. Jesus said it is, it is harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to literally go through the eye of a needle. And his disciples said, well, who then can be saved? And Jesus said, with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. See, it takes God to save you, because you don't want to be saved until he works on you. He begins salvation by calling you, drawing you, convicting you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Making you miserable, in other words, miserable with yourself. And then shows you the solution. Jesus Christ, the Savior, who died on the cross for your sins. For all those who are believers in him. This is an ongoing thing. John 3.16, when it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that all those who believe, whosoever believeth. That is not the best translation there, because it's a, it's a Greek participle, which doesn't translate well. All those who are believers in him. See, the word believer there functions as a noun, but it's a descriptive noun. It's a verb made into an adjective, which is made into a noun. So it, is, it talks about people who are characterized by believing in Jesus Christ. That's the center of their life. That's their identity. They are believers in the Lord Jesus. That's the most important thing there is to them. That's why Jesus could say to those people, take up your cross and follow me, perhaps to death. Anyway, that doesn't sell too good if you want to build a mega church. Cheap and easy salvation. See, God's grace is free. Like I said, it's like joining the military. It's free, but it'll cost you everything. It'll cost you your hair. It'll cost you your freedom. It'll cost you your identity. It might cost you your life. It's a lot like becoming a Christian. See, he demands your loyalty, your obedience. He demands everything. You're his property. He purchased you on the cross. Now, if you don't like that, you don't have to follow him. God has a place prepared for you. It's like taking a drink of water. You don't have to have a PhD to do that. Take a drink of water. Look at it, precious friend, in verse 17. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life. It's there. Take it and drink it. That's the reason why I call this a satisfying proposal. You will never have your deepest heart thirst satisfied until you're satisfied with Jesus. And if you're thirsty, come and drink, and he will save you, I promise you, on the authority of this word of God. You say, but Pastor Rogers, what if I'm not one of the elect? What if I'm not one of the elect? Well, would it help? Could I be more sure if he said, and if Adrian Rogers will come and drink? Okay, uh, that he must have had some place in the sermon uh, as a whole, Calvinism. Uh, the elect uh, are referred, oh, it's a scriptural term, those who are chosen by God. Uh, to be elect means to be chosen. Who does God choose to be his children? Those who believe in Christ. Those are the elect. 
Calvinism makes it into something more complicated. You don't have to believe Calvinism. You just have to believe Christ and the gospel, the Bible. If you don't believe the Bible, you don't trust Jesus Christ because he is the word of God and he gave it all. So let's uh, take a look at this scripture. I want to show you why you should not pay an awful lot of attention to some of these famous Bible teachers or theologians or whatever. Uh, not that you should pay more attention to me than to them necessarily. Pay attention to somebody who directs you to the Word of God and handles it accurately, not just takes people's pieces out of context. So the, the, the verse he's quoting here is from Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. This is the New King James. This is a version I would recommend uh, for you. And the, the King James has certain advantages, but this is accurate, and it agrees with the vast majority of manuscripts, unlike some of the other newer versions. And it is... Uh, if you can, you can follow along the King James, if somebody's reading the King James with the new King James, it's just updated grammar, upgraded vocabulary, uh, updated. That's it. But it is, uh, and sometimes they actually corrected a translation thing to make it a little bit more accurate. So this is, the only thing is, it's copywritten. They haven't revised it since it came out in 1982. That's a good thing. These Bibles that they're always revising, well, you don't want to memorize those. Uh, for memorization, if you want to memorize a verse, memorize it in the King James. Nobody's going to be able to change it. Otherwise, you'll have a, a, mem a memory verse that's not connected to an existing Bible. <clears throat> so it says here in uh, verse 17 of chapter 22 in the book of Revelation, which is also written by John, and the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts, Come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. Yes, it's free, just like joining the military is free. Whosoever desires, can come. I mean, if you meet the physical requirements. And you're a citizen. Well, you don't. They don't even always require that. But again, there's a commitment involved, a very large commitment. But you don't have to be prepared for it. You don't have to come with the ability to do what they're going to require. They will equip you. They will train you. You don't come with your own firearms. You don't come with your own training. They don't care. They just want your body. They'll do everything else for you. And they're going to reshape your body, too, I'll tell you that. Uh, and I was only in the Air Force. Wimpy. Wimpy. The Air Force was wimpy, physically. I mean, basic training was for wimps. Uh, it was. I, I'd tell people what they did, and everybody gets like a joke. I thought it was a joke. Farm boy, you know, they, why do they come on? You got to be kidding me. Uh, I got dirtier out run, running around the farm than I ever did in basic training. Uh, I'll tell you. Uh, anyway, back to this. <laughs> it's a little bit of a side issue. But see, J Adrian Rogers correctly quotes Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. But he doesn't tell you everything it says there in the context. That's why you shouldn't trust preachers. Check it out. Check what they say out. Are they using Scripture properly in context? Or are they mutilating the Bible and just telling you what they want you to hear because they want you to fill the offering plate and fill their church building? They want to have a big name in the denomination, like Adrian Rogers did. I believe he was the president of the SPC for some time. He had a big mega church. Did Jesus have a mega church? No, he didn't. At one point, everybody left him but the twelve. He drove them away by teaching them hard things because they were following him for the wrong reason. 
Gospel of John. Let's see, is it chapter 10 or is it 6? I don't know. So if you, if you just back up three verses to chapter, uh, to verse 14 here, what do we have? Let me move my thing over so I can see it better. This is Jesus speaking. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Now, this is the city of God, the city of the saints. The tree of life was a tree that they could have eaten in the garden, but they didn't, Adam and Eve. They chose the other tree, the tree they weren't supposed to eat of, but outside, outside the, the uh, gates of the city and away from the tree of life, but outside are dogs. Those are references to homosexuals. Sorcerers, the sexually immoral, and murderers and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify you, to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take and of the water of life freely. Do you see there's a little more context here? Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life. Ah, so apparently salvation produces obedience. It's called the obedience of faith. It is not a work we do to get eternal life. It's a work we do because we have eternal life, that God has changed us. And we desire to do what God wants. We desire to please God because God has changed our heart. Not to obtain salvation, but because we have been saved. Very few people seem to understand that. That obedience is the fruit of salvation. See, that's not a problem with Calvinism. That's a problem with what's called easy believism. That is rampant among the Southern Baptists. And apparently with Faith on Fire also, who is, I have no idea what that young man is. Other than he seems to want to attract women by teaching them that they can preach in the pulpit and pastor churches, which the Bible forbids. So if you want to follow people that tickle your flesh, that tell you what you want to hear, be my guest. If you want to follow Jesus Christ, he calls us to do his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you don't love him, well, Paul says, let those who do not love the Lord be accursed, an anthem. If you don't love Jesus Christ, you're not saved. Don't be satisfied with anything less than real salvation, that God transforms your heart, that he makes you into a disciple of Jesus Christ. Everything less than that is not enough.